Hello and welcome to an all new episode of Duval County Public Schools Real Talk Podcast. My name is Matt Began. And I'm Vicki Pierre. And today we're going to discuss the continuing efforts to develop and support great educators and leaders here in Duval County Public Schools. With us is our superintendent of schools, Dr. Nikolai Vitti. Hey, Matt. And we're also joined by Duval Teachers United President Terry Brady. How you doing? I'm doing great. We're so glad that both of y'all are here today. So first question, we're going to go with Dr. Vitti. You are a former teacher. Tell us about the paperwork demands that come with the job, because I don't know that the average person truly understands what teachers have to do outside of instruction. Sure. Um, as a former teacher and, and, and knowing, uh, being in classrooms, talking to teachers, um, the paperwork the natural paperwork that that teachers um, have are required to complete are things like lesson plans, um, grade inputting, um, uh, sometimes forms um, that are unnecessary at the principal level, assistant principal level, um, as part of learning communities, um, paperwork linked to professional development, um, paperwork linked to their employment, their health insurance. Um, but there's also paperwork linked to maintaining um, data on students and how students are progressing or not progressing, phone calls made to parents, meetings with parents. Um, so I've just rattled off maybe five to ten examples of paperwork. And all of that often, some of that is required by law, um, and some of that is necessary only from a documentation point of view to help guide your work with individual students. Um, but yet some of that paperwork is unnecessary and duplicative. And I, and I think what we have seen in Duval, and I don't think Duval is radically different than other large districts or even small districts for that matter, um, that you often find layers of paperwork that are repetitive and duplicative, um, where the left hand doesn't know what the right hand is requiring. And one person may really need this information and another person may really need the information, but there's a way to streamline it um, so it's done once and then properly shared with, with different individuals. So um, ultimately, paperwork uh, gets in the way of students concentrating on students, which is ultimately what they're there to do and what they're passionate and energetic about doing every day um, as part of their job. Now, Ms. Brady, as a former teacher, um, you've been out of the classroom for a little while, but even though things change year to year as they go, what are some of the challenges you're hearing about that the teachers are facing with this paperwork? They spend more time doing paperwork than they do prepping for the instruction of their students. In some cases, some of the paperwork truly does enhance. It guides the work, like Dr. Vitti said, about meeting the individual needs of the students, whether it's subject matter or whether it's certain standards or skills. But teachers are taking too much of their personal time away from the classroom and away from their families to do the duplication of work in the past. And Dr. Vitti's aware of it, and so are, and so are we. Um, our teachers just want to better prepare for the, the classroom and have better prep time. So through this initiative, along with other collective bargaining agreements that we were able to put together this year, we hope to give teachers and afford teachers greater ability to do collaboration with their peers. We hope that they're during school time, not on Saturdays at Starbucks or at you know the local breakfast mm -hmm. hangout, but to do it during school time to collaborate with their peers about setting forth horizontal and vertical planning, and also taking papers paperwork off the table. This is just the beginning. It's just the beginning, and um, Dr. V and I have agreed that we need to continue to look and to examine and take away all the duplication that we possibly can, and we want our teachers to have a the best quality of life they can, not only in the classroom, but a quality of life with their families so they're not sacrificing one for the other. There's got to be a quality of balance. And I think that's where we're trying to get to now. Now, it's, so it's not just a prepping for each class. We're also talking about reduction of overall testing also, which will take some of the, mm -hmm. uh, the strain away from the teachers. Correct. Correct. Um, so uh, obviously, we're the, the, the most recent conversation is about paperwork, but um, part of what has gotten in the way with strengthening the relationship between teachers and students or just allowing teachers more time to focus on their students has been testing. And that's a, uh, been a concern um, really since the focus has shifted at the national level and state level 
to focus more on standardized testing. I, certainly, I think every educator agrees that there's a role for testing, that we have to measure how our children are doing so we can properly intervene, um, so we can highlight the educators that are doing great things and work with the educators whose, whose um, students' performance isn't at the same level. Um, but at the same time, uh, that pendulum has swung from very little accountability to everything being about a test. And, and districts have gotten caught up into this because what was required at the federal level then trickles down to the state mm-hmm. level, mm-hmm. which trickles down to the district level, which then trickles down to the, cla- to the school and then to the classroom level. Um, and so what we are doing in Duval, and, and over the last two years we have reduced assessments, but we're going to a whole other level going into next year by completely eliminating what's known as the curriculum guide assessment or CGAs. Okay. Uh, they will be completely um, eliminated for next year. Um, and I think we'll talk more about that as we, we go through the conversation. And so with these changes that are being discussed and that are being planned for, uh, we hear the term memorandum of understanding. The average person probably doesn't know what that means. So could you explain what that is and what it accomplishes in this specific instance? So um, um, a memo, uh, a memorandum of understanding or an MOU is used to um, address issues uh, that may not be in the collective bargaining agreement. Mm-hmm. Um, so the collective bargaining agreement is a is a contract that's agreed upon between labor and management to define the working conditions of uh, of employees. And, and it it clearly states, um, if you will, the rules of engagement um, between labor and and manage uh, labor and and um, and management. And but sometimes that collective bargaining agreement does not able to identify all the issues that surface in the work environment. So um, labor um, and management have to problem solve and communicate and collaborate uh, to define and address the issues that that are surfacing in the field. And so the MOU allows you to address those issues. So in this instance. With paperwork um, reduction, we know from our teachers that we have to do a better job of streamlining all the paperwork that they're required to do. And so this has been an issue that came up for me when I became superintendent with the what I would call the former um, board because we had significant change on, on the board uh, when I became superintendent. Um, and it continued as a theme even with the new board. And then as I engage teachers through town hall meetings and every voice sessions and visiting schools, um, and it's being in the classrooms, recognizing all this duplication and overlaying. Um, and so this has been an ongoing um, process um, as far as looking at paperwork. There were um, task forces that were created even before I became superintendent. But finally, we are able to put all of that together in an MOU that clearly defines um, – uh, what paperwork is required um, based on law and best practices, um, but more importantly, what is not required. Um, and it also defines a process to allow if, if the uh, items that we have identified that are required to be used, which are 13 documents um, that are required, if there's anything that's needed beyond those three, then it has to go through sh- shared decision making at the school level where the principal team of teachers work together to say, well, these 13 documents doesn't define everything that we need in our particular school, and there's a defined process to doing it. But it has to go through that process so we don't return to the layering of paperwork that we're trying to solve now. And I think Ms. Brady and I agree that we're not going to address all these issues in this MOU regarding paperwork, but it's a tremendous stride in the right direction, and it sets the precedence to continuing this work moving forward. And I think also in addition to that um, is that it shows good faith to our employees, that the superintendent, the union, and all of us, we have heard the outcries that all of our teachers have got to have some breathing room. The old saying is they've got to exhale because um, it's just too much. It just comes down on them. And until you're in the classroom, until you speak to a teacher, until you live with a teacher, until you were a teacher, no one doesn't have an idea about the level of work that it takes just to meet these needs. So the biggest thing is on the surface, it's respect and dignity for the teachers that somebody's listening to them. It's also a continuation of respect and dignity to show that we're gonna continue to do what's right for them, but yet still hold them accountable in moving students academically. So I think that is very, very important that it's not done yet. 
It's a start, and things are being taken off the table. But I do want to elaborate what Dr. Vitti said, that even though he and the school board want to take off the CGAs and others, under Senate Bill 736, which was a, the largest unfunded mandate that the legislature put onto school districts three and a half, four years ago, in that element, it basically stated that we had to have measurement instruments for the teacher evaluation. So when we take things off the table, we have to be very cognizant of something else being put on that maybe is limited in the amount of time that it takes or the cost factor so we can measure student growth as it relates to a teacher performance pay and their evaluation. So every single thing is tied to something else. So when we do an MOU, we just don't walk into a table and do a memorandum of understanding in five minutes and say, this is the way it is. We have to talk through the laws, the requirements, what is the, what is the domino effect on their evaluations, and what are we going to put in its place. And I think that's one thing we can actually you know, celebrate here, that through the collaboration process, the, the administration brings things to the table and so do we and we try to find a finished product that is be best for all of our teachers mm -hmm. without violating requirements of federal and state law and frankly more importantly the policies and the direction of our superintendent and our school board because that to me is more sacred to my teachers and me than it is any somebody in Tallahassee doing this and somebody in Washington doing this when they've never stepped foot in our district to see our children or what the needs are so let's maintain the integrity of our policy and the direction of learning for our our students and our employees by the superintendent and the school board's policy as we move forward. And I think it's important to note that um, the MOU um, is, is a start mm -hmm. um, in refining and improving the process of paperwork and assessments, um, but the, the document has to come alive and mm -hmm. it has to be implemented. And, and I think that is a, there's a tremendous uh, amount of responsibility uh, and ownership that has to happen um, at the district level administratively, but most importantly at the school level administratively. Because when we say that th there are 13 documents, we mean that there are 13 documents, not not 15, not 20. Um, and and if there needs to be more than that, then it has to go through sh shared decision making. And that's something that on the administrative side we have to own, we have to monitor, and hold people accountable to actually implementing that. And 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 I'm. Um, firmly making that commitment on the administrative sure. side that that will happen because the last thing I want to do is celebrate this MOU and create uh, momentum to streamlining processes to allow the teacher to be more free to work with students in the right way. Um, and yet, in reality, when it comes from an implementation side, that's not what's going to happen. And, and that's going to take communication when it's not happening. It's going to take uh, accountability and follow up to make sure that that's done the right way. And I think, um, Dr. Vitti, you're exactly right. When he talks about the 13 documents, that still sounds like a lot, but it doesn't mean it's 13 for elementary, 13 for secondary. There's going to be certain ones for elementary and middle high, and, and high school. The thing that he hasn't mentioned yet, which is more important, currently right now, teachers are required to have 40 plus documents that they must fulfill in the responsibilities of some requirement, somewhere, somehow. So if you use the comparison of the number that they had versus where they're going down to, it is a big drop. And that's the comparison that we have to show. Because, you know, like I said, your, your listening audience might say, well, oh, well, they only have to do lesson plans and grade sheets. We wish it was only that easy because we have to validate and we have to document, document a lot of what happens in the classroom, not just for our own selves and for the growth of our students, but for outside forces like the state and the federal government. Yeah, and then so when we were doing our review um, through different task force and, and working groups, uh, at least 40 documents were identified that were being required um, by teachers. Um, and and they, these documents were a combination of what may be coming from the state, from the district, or individual schools, or even region um, offices. So, and looking at 40 and going to 30, 13, that's a substantial that's decrease. But not every teacher even has to, on the day to day, their day to day work, even, even have to use the 13 documents, for example. Some just pertain to coaches, um, some pertain uh, to one document being used during grade level or um, uh, common planning at the sec grade level planning at the elementary, common planning at the, at the secondary level. And so, data chats. <laughs> right, right. So, and, and um, what's important is that once this one of these thirteen are used, 
it doesn't require then another one to be used for the same thing. And I think that's an important point. One of the things I wanted to touch on real quick is one of the positive side effects of this plan, and that is going to be recruitment and retention of the teachers. I don't think it's going to have a direct bearing on recruitment. What we sell about recruitment is that Duval County is the quiet district in the state of Florida that teachers need to come to if they want to have a career in education because they get the support and they get valued for the efforts that they put in our classroom. I think what it does is it helps us with retention. As you know, we're one of the fortunate districts to have Teach for America teachers here that give us a commitment for two years. And we want to be able to not only say, don't just do your two years, but fall in love with teaching and stay in teaching and make a commitment to teaching because it's about our students. And it's about the effort that you've put forth for two years. It's about recruiting those College of Ed teachers here, and then once we get them here, get them to stay here. We're seeing not just in Duval, but even in the mega districts like Dade, Broward, and Palm Beach, teachers are leaving because they're not prepared for the responsibilities, whether it's paperwork or the sacrifices they're making in their own personal lives. This will have a greater bearing on the retention side, where I don't think it will have that greater bearing on our on our recruitment, but the retention is as important, or I think in a lot of cases, more important to keep them here because this district spends over six to $7,000 a year for a single teacher for training, whether it's curriculum, whether it's through collaboration, whether it's cultural diversity, whatever the case may be. And we invest those resources to train them up, to teach them up, and then they leave after a year, two years, three years, five years, and we don't want that. I want to go back to the old days of having career teachers, people that love what they're doing. They have teaching in their hearts, and they used to say, we used to have chalk dust in our blood. I guess now it's a marking pen or something electronic. But, you know, if you got chalk dust in your blood, you're going to work and be a teacher for life, whether you're directly in the classroom or you're giving support to that classroom. I still think we need to go back to where education was founded, but we've got to listen to what the teachers are saying to retain them. And I think that's what Dr. Beattie and the union and his administration has done. We're trying to move forward with making those working conditions better to retain our teachers that we currently have now. And I want to make it, I'm going to just add, we want to keep those with 25 and 30 years if they're highly effective or effective teachers. We don't want them to get burned out. Mm -hmm. We want them to stay because they have so many strong, good pedagogy skills that we need to not only mentor those new teachers to stay, but also to still stand before our students and give the best that we can every day. I agree with, with, with all of that. The only thing that I would add is the work is hard enough. Absolutely. Um, the, the, the lift uh, that, that, that teachers have to take on day to day with the challenges that are brought uh, to them from the community, um, from um, uh, the greater society is, is hard enough. And, and our job is to minimize the extra lift or the extra weight mm -hmm. as much as possible. And I think the paperwork and assessments uh, contributed to that mm -hmm. added weight in addition to what is already brought um, from the greater society. Um, and now I think hopefully um, in the years to come, the federal government and the state government um, starts to recognize what they're adding um, to that weight load. And so there have been some ref refinement to different um, policies over the last uh, year or so, but it's still not deep enough. And, and I think if every uh, every policy making entity commits to reducing that poundage, then that lift that is net more natural from the greater society will will become less, and we'll see more 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 high quality people entering the field and staying uh, in the field of education. And just really quickly, does this go into effect immediately or is it next school year? So so next school year, um, all these changes go into effect next school year. The other component of this is the training. Um, so we've worked internally um, uh, and on both sides of the table to make the MOU happen. Um, between now, toward the end of the year and into the summer, there'll be training on the administrative side at the school level. Uh, and then uh, there'll be a series of, of, of workshops for teachers and, and other um, folks to attend between now and the beginning of the year. But then certainly at the beginning of the year with faculty meetings starting off, there'll be a deeper discussion of this and emails and other information. Hopefully this podcast is an also a, an opportunity to communicate uh, with those in the field as well. We're actually doing a workshop at Duval Teachers United for any teacher, not just union members, to come next week in collaboration with some of the individuals from the Academic Services Department 
to start exactly what Dr. Vitti is stating. It's talking about how to design the new lesson plan templates, how to workshop the new lesson plan templates, because no matter what some people still might think, teachers don't have two months off without doing stuff. They always start preparing their lessons, they prepare their activities, they prepare their support, they go to workshops, and I think that the, the more information we give them early on, the better it's going to be. How would, do they need to sign up for any of these courses? Um, no, the courses that we're taking is going to be um, next week on the 19th at the Schultz Center. But the Teacher Academy, they were going to be getting an email through the district um, and they will be notified of the various weeks that it will be offered. And it basically it's first come, first serve. But the Teacher Academy is going to be more than just the paperwork reduction. It's going to be on the new curriculum that, that the district's getting ready to adopt for math and for science and for reading. And it's an exciting time because I might want to add, even though it's not part of our discussion, we heard from teachers that our curriculum wasn't meeting their needs with Common Core. It started it, but it needed to go deeper. We needed to give greater support. And the superintendent and the academic services did committee work. They did listening tours. They did their, their great research. And I think the board has had discussions on adopting some, some reading and math curriculum and science curriculums that can go deeper into the lesson. It correlates Common Core a lot better than what currently we have this year. And teachers won't have have to go out and do so many, in old terms, make and takes to give support to those lessons. They have it right there in the, in the curriculum. And I think that's another exciting thing where we're developing a great curriculum next year with less paperwork, a three-year agreement. We have better support, greater in-service, and a curriculum that's going to meet the teacher's need to teach our students and get them to raise to a higher academic level. So, you know, the old saying is sometimes all things have to start aligning. Well, we've been working for two years to get this aligned. And and I think next year, you're 15, 16, on record <laughs> as a union president. I think those stars are starting to align that through through, a, through a, a, an amended version of the Code of Conduct with a three-year collective bargaining agreement with r drastic reductions in paperwork ongoing, with doing listening to the teachers, with giving greater support, giving them greater prep time, and then turn around in the curriculum that the district has adopted – and the money, because all of this does cost money. And I want to add, the Florida le legislature has not been that generous, has not been that generous with stopping the unfunded mandates. So no matter what they give us without money, we have to come up with something to meet the needs. And it's shifting, and it's doing the best job. But as long as we always keep the sights of our students first and the balance of the employees we have, hopefully we're going to make it work. You mentioned students first, and that leads me right into my next question. We're talking a lot about paperwork reduction. Well, students are also going to be seeing less testing. Uh, how did we come about with that? Well, as I said earlier, it's been a, a process. Um, and so going into next year, uh, we will rely on our diagnostic assessments in reading um, and in math through Achieve and iReady. Uh, that significantly reduces the amount of prep time and um, instructional downtime with, um, with relying on computer-based testing rather than paper tests. So the only district tests, if you will, that, that students will have to take in 15-16 uh, will be a mid-year um, FSA scrimmage-like test for the tested grade levels uh, at the state level um, in reading, math, and science. So if a student in their particular class will take a FSA, which is the Florida State Assessment, the state exam at the end of the year, um, then they will take a mid-year FSA test, which will be like the test they'll take at the end of the year. And the feedback from teachers is they do want to test, that gives them some sense of how their kids will do on the state assessment at the end of the year. And so that was to meet their needs, um, but there was no reason um, to do it three times, and that's what we were doing through the CGA. We would have a baseline and then more of a fall and, l and early winter type of test based on the standards and the benchmarks, and that, were, that was known as our CGA. So those are go going to be completely eliminated. Um, in addition to the mid-year um, FSA-like test 
and the use of iReady and Achieve, which are good diagnostic tools to understand where kids are and the kind of growth that they're making throughout the year, um, is, is what Mrs. Brady talked about earlier, which is what is required by the state regarding evaluations. Um, so our teachers um, are required to have 33% of their evaluation now based on um, student growth or student performance. And the only way to measure that outside of the state assessment um, process for reading and math is to have district assessments um, so that students take a pretest at the beginning of the year and a post test at the end of the year. So um, when we talk about what is required, those are required in order to fulfill the need for the 33% of the evaluation. So there's no way of getting around that unless we were going to give um, non-reading and math teachers the scores that would come from reading and math. And that really doesn't make sense, uh, and it's not fair, and we've heard that directly from teachers. A social studies teacher doesn't want the score from reading to apply to their evaluation. Um, they want something that is directly linked to the content mm -hmm. that they're teaching, which would be social studies or for an art teacher, art, music, um, economics, et cetera. So the, the only, to be clear, the only district assessments that will be in place for 15-16 is the mid-year um, FSA scrimmage, um, if you will, for those that uh, for those subject area and grade levels uh, that have a state assessment at the year, end of the year and um, tests that are linked to teacher evaluations, only a pre and a post, um, and that's it. All the other district level assessments will be eliminated, um, and this will dramatically reduce the, um, the amount of tests and increase the amount of instructional time for um, uh, teachers and students. And so students, every session that I've ever had with, with, with students, and they email me at least once a week, and that's a good thing, is we have to reduce the amount of, of testing that's happening. And unfortunately, uh, students feel that it's the district that is requiring all this testing. Um, and a lot of it is linked to state uh, requirement, the, nat the, the natural state assessments that are linked to accountability and the testing that's linked to evaluation. So uh, we are only down to that is what is, is required outside of the practice FSA in the mid-year. So at the end of the day, we've talked about a lot of changes that are coming down the road. What do you want parents to understand? What do you want them to get out of this knowing about what has been worked on so far? Well, on my end, I, I want them to know that we are being responsive um, as an organization. Uh, as I've said, our customer is the parent. Um, and we have to think that way with the landscape of choices, uh, whether we agree with them or not, that are that are out there in Jacksonville and throughout the country. And so all of these changes are in response to what parents are saying regarding testing and even teachers. They, they want uh, the person that's working with their children every day to be freed as much as possible from the bureaucracy and red tape uh, so that they can work with their child. Um, that's come out in sessions that I've had with parents. It comes out in what we, what we hear reported in the media often. Um, and so I would challenge any charter school, um, I would challenge any private school um, to show that, that they're testing less than we are and that we've reduced a lot of the constraints that teachers face in the classroom. And that's what we are now about. We are competitive. If, if the landscape is about competition, we're going to compete and we're going to win um, because of, of steps like this to be more responsive um, to what we're hearing from parents, from students, and from teachers. And I'd just like to also add that um, I want our parents to get more involved in the school as it relates to a respective and, and, and collaborative relationship with their schools. Teaching is hard, but education is hard now. And no way is any of this, these things being taken off the table, whether it's paperwork or testing, is this district dummying down their standards or dummying down the expectations of what students' high academics standards and goals need to be. What we're doing is we're just trying to modify the external requirements so that when the teacher stands before the students, they're doing the best job he or she can do to prepare and to present those skills and that knowledge level to those students every single minute of every single day. And that's what's important in our schools. And let me tell you something, teaching is hard, no matter if you're in a charter school or a public school. But I will tell you, you've got committed men and women every day in those classrooms that don't go in 
and say, let's fail Johnny today. They go in and say, what are we going to do to modify, to intervene, and to help them achieve at their highest level? And this district and the union are going to work collaboratively to give them the tools they need so they can continue to push and move our students forward. And I wish we had more autonomy as a district without so many state and federal requirements. I think we could do better. And I wish we had less unfunded mandates because I know we could stretch the dollar better. Don't you, Dr. Reedy? But I will tell you right now, we're doing the best we can with what we are given. We're not making excuses and we continue to move forward. Go out in the neighborhoods and go in your schools, whether you have students or not, and see the excitement that's going on, no matter if you're at the beaches or Baldwin or the west side or the north side, because exciting and learning is going on every single day in these schools. And to learn more about what's going on in our schools, you can always go to duvalschools.org. I do want to thank you both for coming in on a very busy day and uh, talking about this uh, paperwork reduction. Thank you. With us. And, uh, and we also want to thank you for listening at home. And this has been the Real Talk Podcast.